Well, hello, and welcome to Let's Talk About the Middle East. I'm Andy Blanche. And I'm Juliana Mushayev. On this show, we talk about the Middle East. It's culture, politics, religion, history, just about anything that captures the complexity of the region. We hope to promote open and honest discussion about the conflict in Israel and Palestine and to humanize the conflict by getting to know people who have a stake in the issues. You're listening to WSLR 96.5 LPFM in Sarasota and WBPV 100.1 LPFM in Bradenton. The opinions and views expressed on Let's Talk About the Middle East are strictly those of the hosts and guests and do not necessarily reflect those of the station manager, the board of directors, or anyone else affiliated with WSLR. With the election rapidly approaching, it's important to take a careful look at what we'll be facing under a Clinton or Trump presidency. Clinton's approach to foreign policy is fairly well known from her years in the Senate and as Secretary of State. Trump's approach, on the other hand, is a bit hard to parse, in part because he has no political history and in part because he is so inconsistent. But there are clues we can look at for both candidates not just in the statements and decisions they've made and in their personal styles, but in the policy advisors they've surrounded themselves with. Whoever gets elected will shape foreign policy for the next four or eight years. Our guest today has arrived. He is Frank Alcock, an associate professor of political science at New College of Florida, where he teaches courses on world politics, international law, and environmental policy. He appears regularly as a political analyst with ABC News in Sarasota, and he hosts a regular TV show on the Manatee Education television channel. Professor Alcock joined us a few months ago during the primaries to talk about the foreign policy differences between Democratic contenders Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton. He's back with us today to discuss the foreign policies of Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. We're thrilled to have you back again, Frank. Very, very happy to be here. So great. Let's start with a question I raised in the introduction. What evidence can we actually use to draw conclusions about each of the two candidates' likely foreign policies? And how confident can we be about what they each might actually do once they are in office? I think I'm a bit more confident about uh, Hillary's track record uh, and her approach uh, to, to foreign policy uh, than I am of Donald Trump. There's more of a mystery there and there's less evidence. I think for Hillary Clinton, I think her experience has, has shaped her worldviews and her um, her impulses and her approach to foreign policy. And I'll go back. I, I think um, the, her husband's time in the White House, I think, really shaped a lot of her uh, worldviews and her foreign policy views. I remember in the early years, because I had just gotten out of college and I was working for the Energy Department, and I actually had um, above a top secret security clearance. And so mm-hmm. I was aware of much of what was going on in the world. And there was just immense frustration with the situation in the Balkans and then mm-hmm. later on in the mid 1990s in, in Rwanda. We had better intelligence in terms of the genocide that was happening in the Balkans. Later, again, we found out the magnitude of of what had happened um, in Rwanda. And I do remember even like staffers at the State Department uh, quitting in frustration. How, how can we let this happen when we have the ability to do something more about it? And late in the Clinton administration, you see the application, a more aggressive application of NATO's power in the Balkans. Um, And it worked out relatively well in terms of bringing that conflict under control. Now we can come back, and certainly, there, you know, the application of NATO's power to uh, Kosovo and what happened afterward—it's a longer debate, so it's not above reproach or criticism. But I think what we, I take away from that is I think that that shaped some of Hillary Clinton's views, which were let's just not let these problematic areas uh, get too out of hand before we do something about it. I think when she got into the Senate as a New York senator. Um, she befriended John McCain and some of the more hawkish uh, senators uh, and then built a rapport and there was a healthy amount of respect. Uh, and I think you saw the very uh, the quick uh, vote on her part for the war in Iraq. 
Uh, and then things change a little bit. She, so she becomes a presidential candidate. She does not get the nomination in 2008, but becomes a foreign um, the secretary of state. Uh, she learns, certainly, that the Iraq didn't go all that well. And I think those impulses to intervene and apply American power did get us into uh, trouble, Libya and some other mm -hmm. places. So where is she now? I think she's one of these people um, that, again, her impulse would be to intervene, uh, but not necessarily to, you know, to construct an American, a new era of imperialism, which brings her sometimes to this halfway zone where mm -hmm. uh, if done, you know, if the application of American power uh, is done in a savvy way and all these other things you don't control break in your favor, then sometimes it ends well. But sometimes you find your play, yourself in a, in a nowhere – in the middle of nowhere, and it gets yourself into trouble. Uh, she's going to have to weigh all that, but I think kind of that halfway approach is what we'd likely see uh, from her. With Donald Trump, it's just, you know, uh, his, his statements, there's not much coherence to them. I don't think there's a lot of uh, understanding. So I don't know what you're going to get. I mean, uh, what you see in terms of his rhetoric on the foreign, you know, you, you see a lack of uh, understanding, I think, of a lot of issues uh, on the international stage incoherent and sometimes contradictory uh, statements. And, you know, if he becomes president, I just don't know what you're going to see. Uh, so one thing we can look to is the foreign policy advisors that the two candidates have engaged to work on their campaigns and to help them with position um, statements. Um, and uh, maybe the kind of people they are each likely to call on to to fill key foreign policy positions. So given what they've each done to date in that respect, who they've surrounded themselves with, can you draw any kind of conclusions about Trump's directions from that? Concern, I think, uh, with respect to Donald Trump, the four individuals that he had named a few months ago as his his a star-studded team were, were anything but uh, these more, you know, mid-level staffers without much of a, of a track record. Uh, and it was puzzling, I think, to the foreign policy establishment. The Subsequently to that, you had 50 Republican foreign policy experts sign this letter coming out against Donald Trump. And I recognized a lot of those names because a lot of those people were working at a time where I was involved in foreign policy uh, in, in the 1990s. And there's sincere and legitimate concern there. So I don't know what you can tell from the, you know, the right now, Donald Trump is not surrounding himself with anybody uh, that's noteworthy in terms of foreign policy. And it's been more of a, uh, again, a very in a, in a, an erratic uh, zigzagging in terms of where he is and some of his statements. I think what would happen if he were to become president uh, is you would have somebody that would uh, step in and essentially assume control of the direction of our foreign policy. And I don't think uh, Donald Trump would have uh, much of a role in that direction. Uh, what would that type of person be? The only thing that I can tell you is he seems to have this affinity for strong men like Putin. Mm -hmm. So you might get a Dick Cheney type of, again, aggressive um, almost coercive approach to to foreign policy, but I don't know. I don't know. I think in in in, uh, in Trump's case, which you'll see, is somebody new uh, uh, come in, somebody that we don't really see right now, and ha and be able to shape foreign policy. In Hillary Clinton's case, it's the opposite, and there's probably a hundred or two hundred people advising her. She's got the entire foreign policy establishment that goes back to the Clinton administration and before. She'll have a lot of people that are involved in the Obamas, uh, um, the. Uh, the Obama administration, it'll be, you know, if there's any problem, too many cooks in the, in the kitchen. Um, mm -hmm, but I do mm -hmm. think you know, Hillary Clinton has been a secretary of state, and so she'll certainly want to put her own stamp on our foreign policy. And I think the direction, you're probably going to see a combination of a balance between, you know, folks that are a bit more hawkish, but uh, with some that are a bit more balanced, and she'll have her large team, and, and I think her impulses will be uh, to intervene um, uh, but not go too far, and sometimes that'll work, and sometimes that won't. So, if I'm if I'm following your train of logic, um, Donald Trump is likely to kind of defer to the Republican Party, and um, they may step in and um, sort of fill the vacuum in his 
um, in his lack of foreign policy experience and sort of suggest somebody that might step up and run foreign policy. Um, That's probably my hope (laughs) in that at least whether I agree with their impulses and ideology, at least somebody that knows what they're doing will step up and yeah. uh, I, it, because I just don't think that Donald Trump really knows what he's doing on the world stage. I don't think yeah. n- more nuclear weapons or abandoning NATO or carpet bombing, you know, people because they you know, they go you with a tweet in the middle of the night is a way to conduct foreign policy. So I don't think that that would happen. I think somebody that knows what they're doing, he would just okay. defer, I think. To, so so I, while, while we're on this topic of who surrounds themselves with whom, um, there's a lot of concern that Hillary has been associated with the neocon movement and Henry K- Kissinger in particular. We talked about that last time. Um, what would you say to, to people who have that concern? I would say, uh, let's hope that uh, she's not overly influenced by that, you know, those neocon I- impulses. Uh, if, if she were, and we continue to repeat a number of the mistakes that we've seen um, delivered to us by neocons or just throughout American history without learning anything from that, that would be a, a um, a significant disappointment. So it's my hope uh, that uh, Hillary Clinton is somebody, again, that uh, uh, tries to respect what's good about different ideas from different quarters, blend them into her her own um, approach to foreign policy. But I do think uh, one thing that I can say, for better or worse, um, in the case of Hillary Clinton, I think she's driven less by ideology and more by her own personal experiences um, about what works and what doesn't work. The problem with that is, as far as I'm concerned, in my lifetime, you know, my 25 years of professional experience doing some foreign policy uh, early and then teaching it for a while, I've discovered no um, magic formulas for conducting foreign policy. It's, it's often a damned if you do, damned if you don't. Um, and many things, many things uh, are out of your control. And so in terms of uh, addressing some of the hot spots and some of the problems in the world, you have to bring a healthy respect of humility about what it is you can and cannot accomplish. Uh, at the same time, if you do nothing, sometimes problems uh, get worse. And so it's really, really tough. Hopefully she has some of that humility uh, you know, and, and has learned a little bit. And so that's more, maybe I'm projecting my hopes onto <laughs> Hillary Clinton, but uh, if she were to become president. I think president, many of us but, are doing that at this point. Yeah, but uh, no, if, if she becomes, you know, uh, Henry Kissinger in a, you know, or Nixon in a pantsuit, that wouldn't be very good for, for any of us. Uh, so last time you were here, you made the the sort of interesting point to me that, um, that, some people seem to have a natural bent towards interventionism, and others have a bias against it. Uh, you talked about Clinton as having a bias towards intervening early, in contrast with Bernie Sanders, who you characterized as having a bias against intervention. I know it's hard to predict um, because he is so unpredictable, but if you had to guess, where do you think Donald Trump would would fall on that continuum? You know, given his personality, given what we We've, um, we've we've seen about him. It, it's a very difficult question, and that spectrum might not fit somebody like Donald Trump. And what I mean by yeah. that is, you know, he, he may be, you know, what I see in somebody like him, and unless there's parts of him that I'm not seeing, uh, what I'm seeing is a, just a very, very impulsive person. Uh, without much of a guiding ideology or set of principles, uh, sometimes somebody that uh, will be very, very dismissive as to the significance of a problem that needs to be addressed, and then at other times will overreact. And so, I think you you might see the worst of both worlds with with somebody like Donald Trump, which is uh, a, a, almost an, uh, again a, a coercive style of diplomacy. Um, pushing sort of the rules of the game with respect to what should and should not be uh, uh, allowed, flexing sometimes when he thinks that, uh, um, you know, American power, you know, we can bully somebody into doing what we want them to do. So you might get almost an over-interventionist and and an Mm -hmm. excessive bullying approach uh, on the part of the United States with respect to some of the members of the international community. And at other times, you know, you might see this bromance with Putin where he simply mm-hmm. acquiesces on a number of 
uh, uh, cases on a number of fronts where that is uh, exploited uh, by some of the strong men that are on the, the global stage. And so you might get, again, uh, less engagement uh, and, and less willingness to inc- either increase the cost or stand up to some of the bigger bullies on the world stage and in other areas becoming one of the bigger bullies at the same time. So maybe both too little and too much intervention from the same administration. Uh, I, I, I'm getting the image of somebody who is so unpredictable that um, it's it's – really literally hard to figure out how they would react in any given situation. Right. How, how do you think, again, I know I'm asking you to project, but how do you think other foreign leaders would respond to U.S. foreign policy that had that kind of a question mark under it? Um, I, I, oh, it would, it would be disastrous, um, disastrous for our ability uh, to maintain stable relationships with the, you know the leaders of the rest of the world right now i can tell you there's you know stock in pepto bismol <laughs> for the foreign leaders of the world they're extremely anxious um about having somebody like uh donald trump uh you know with the the suitcase in his hand and at the helm of american foreign policy we remain you know in terms of just power resources across military and then a number of economic areas the most powerful country uh, in the world, and with that power, you know, comes a tremendous amount of responsibility. Like I said, there's no easy recipe for using that, but uh, as a willy-nilly, unpredictable, over the top, and then neglectful. All if all of that becomes the, the, a trademark of a very erratic, um, incoherent foreign policy, it would just be disastrous. Which is why I think um, it. If Donald Trump were to be elected president, I think foreign policy would just be delegated to somebody. Uh, you know that somebody might be pretty bad in terms of a replication of uh, some of the worst tendencies in, a, in American foreign policy, but it might be a little bit more consistent. I think more consistent than you would see it if it was Donald Trump that were making the, the decisions or driving the bus. That actually makes a whole lot of sense. He doesn't have any interest in foreign policy. That's clear. Um, it's clear he doesn't really have a lot of interest in governing. Uh, so it is likely that he will um, select people and delegate a lot. Uh, in fact, I'm guessing that a lot of his supporters are counting on that. And um, I don't, Yeah, I can't speak for yeah. his s- supporters. I do think uh, uh, Donald Trump, there, there's an ego there if you haven't noticed uh so i think he would be somebody that uh would want the attention and that ego stroked in terms of the international and global prestige that comes with being the president of the united states but wouldn't want to be bothered uh at the level of decisions and as i had said earlier i don't think that he's driven by um any coherent strong ideology about world order I think you know, he just wants the the prestige, and he'll probably learn pretty quickly that uh, if he doesn't stick to a script that somebody else provides for him and he's making his own decisions without relying upon somebody to tell him what to do, he's going to get himself into trouble really quick. And he probably at some level will understand that uh, and, and, again, delegate, I mm-hmm. think, the details of foreign policy to – somebody that knows what they're doing. Okay. So uh, we're going to go from um, a series of questions that are really hard for you to answer to one that's probably impossible for you to oh, answer. Great. But, um, you know, on this show, we have talked a lot about the situation in Israel and Palestine. Yes. And um, Secretary Clinton has generally taken a position that's actually very close to that that has been favored by all recent presidents. Basically, our ties to Israel are unbreakable. We'll, we'll do everything we can to assist them, including sending them obscene amounts of uh, military aid. Um, and But that a, a two-state solution is the only workable solution, and that the settlements are illegal and an obstacle to peace. That, I mean, if to oversimplify, that's that's basically our position. Um, the Israeli right accuses Clinton of being no friend of Israel, and they've been kind of down on her. On the other hand, at AIPAC, she you know gave a speech that was quite pandering to Israeli interests. So it's a little hard to tell exactly where Hillary falls down, where she's going to come down. And Donald Trump 
is just as confusing because he clearly has lined himself up with right wing Republicans and, you know, supports the settlements, takes huge donations from people like Sheldon Adelson, you know, who are known to to line up with the Israeli right, um, stokes fear of Muslim terrorism. Um, at, at the same time, he's been, you know, quite openly flirting with anti-Semitic tendencies. Right. Um, And he's maintained he'd be neutral in any negotiation, which is a sort of strange stance to take. It's incoherent. So what do you make about all this? I mean, can we say anything about what either presidency would likely do with that situation? I think in Clinton's case, there's more certainty that, that any changes would be incremental. I don't think that you're going to get, uh, um, it, it probably an extension of some of what you've seen in the Obama administration will she'll be criticized by the Israeli right at the same time the tone of the relationship it's just gotten pretty you know Netanyahu and Obama don't like each other and Hillary would probably try to reset some of that you know a little bit more cordiality or collegiality in terms of the rhetoric the substance of um, our positions and our policies vis-a-vis the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, th- that is a difficult one to solve. I think Clinton would try to make some progress there, but I don't think you'd see much in the way of major shifts of the substance of our policy. I think uh, for a number of reasons, you touched upon some of them. I could touch upon more at some other time, but I think you might see a shift to the right if it were Donald Trump, much because of who you'd be listening to, uh, and it just plays for him domestically. We only have a couple minutes left, um, Frank. The time just flew here. I was a little uh, late, sorry. Uh, about but, that. Uh, but let me ask you just one last question uh, quickly, um, and that has to do with the military-industrial complex, which we have seen growing in strength year by year by year ever since President Eisenhower first warned us about it. Do you think either Trump or Clinton – uh, would tackle that underlying issue that our foreign policy appears to be increasingly driven by a profit-making military machine? Will either of them address that really fundamental underlying problem? And uh, if so, could they be effective? Uh, my answer is I don't think so. In Donald Trump's case, I don't think he has any reason to to want or try. I mean, I think some of what that military industrial complex represents, he's in favor of. He likes that. In Hillary Clinton's case, you know, it. I think it's been one of the criticisms against her. And it's, it's fair in some sense that, you know, she's not out there to transform uh, the power structure of the world. She's just going to try to move the ball within it. And so mm-hmm. I don't think she has it with, within her or she's going to make a major attempt to overhaul the military industrial complex. Frank, thank you so much for this interview. It's been really, really interesting. We've been listening to Professor Frank Alcott talk about the likely foreign policy positions of Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. Uh, Is there a way for listeners to reach you, Frank, or to learn more about your work, a website or Facebook page or something? I'm pretty Googleable, for better or worse. So you can just pop my name in in a Google search and a lot of stuff comes up. I have um, on the New College webpage, there's more of my academic stuff and there's some foreign policy stuff. Electfrankalcock.com. You can get to me through there and this campaign that uh, that we're having for for a little while. Um, So one or the other. If you want more of the academic foreign policy stuff, go through the New College uh, window portal um, campaign oriented stuff go through the electfrankalcock.com so thanks again uh, for helping us uh, try to sort through this confusing mess which is what it seems to be at this point I uh, really appreciate it thanks for having me on so if you want to give us feedback on the show listen to archived interviews or share ideas for topics or speakers you can find us on Facebook just search let's talk about the Middle East our uh, podcasts are also archived on SoundCloud. Our theme music is from Merkava by the Israeli musician and peace activist Gabby Myers. Take care and spread the peace. <laughs>